to Council's fourth Town Hall on Reimagining Public Safety. I am Council Member Shayla Favor, and I'm co-facilitating this Town Hall today alongside Council Member Priscilla Tyson. As a part of Council's Reimagining Safety Initiative, Council is holding six Town Halls to hear from national experts, as well as our residents and community members on how we can improve and strengthen our safety practices in the city of Columbus. These town halls, in addition to focus groups and a community survey, will help inform council as we work towards passing an operating budget in February. Tonight, we will be discussing the topic of alternative public safety crisis response model. We are pleased to have with us guests from NetCare, the Columbus Division of Police, and Columbus Public Health for this discussion. Before we get into our agenda for the evening, I'd like to provide Council Member Tyson with the opportunity to make some opening remark remarks as well. Council Member Tyson? Oh, you're on mute, Council Member. Thank you so much, Councilmember Favor. Uh, again, I'm Councilmember Priscilla Tyson, and I am pleased to co-host this town hall with Councilmember Favor to discuss alternative crisis response models. As a member of this body and a lifelong resident of Columbus, the safety of all Columbus residents is one of primary importance to me. And as a chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, I'm committed to reimagining public safety, and I firmly believe social workers can offer support to law enforcement, as is exemplified with the net care service delivery model and the emerging partnership between Columbus Public Health and the Columbus Police Department. It is also important to acknowledge that our black and brown residents do not feel safe or protected as it relates to law enforcement and our criminal justice system. And we know that these residents are disproportionately impacted by challenges and equities, including the social determinants of health, which consists of housing, crime, incarceration, education, employment, poverty, food insecurity, health care, and public safety. Instead of penalizing them when they need resources, we have to provide services to help residents to thrive. Moreover, considering the disparities that our residents of color face is imperative because racial equity must be at the center of any reimagining police and reimagining safety strategies. If we view racial equity as a central component to reimagining policing, other strategies include alternative responses, which will be discussed today, along with violence prevention, policing reforms, and community engagement. And so this is why I am pleased that this council has taken the opportunity to convene six town halls that allow us to discuss many of these aspects of reimagining public safety while also engaging residents. Further, internally, as we are participating in a racial and racial equity training. So as we consider policy reforms that will improve public safety, we will do so with a focus on racial equity. As I conclude, I want to stress that when residents are in need of other appropriate interventions that we don't, that don't involve incarceration as a community, we need to have programs and systems in place that help people secure affordable and emergency housing, affordable healthy food, job training and jobs that pay livable wages, as well as mental and physical health care services. We must also implement and expand the program models we will discuss today. I'm eager to hear from today's presenters and discuss how we can enhance alternative responses, uh, response strategies. And now I'd like to turn it over to Councilor Favor to get us started with today's speakers. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Tyson. And we have also been joined by a few other council members, uh, Council Member Dorrance, Council Member Remy, as well as Council President Harden. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to any of the gentlemen if you'd like to make some remarks as well. I, I would just quickly say uh, thank you to uh, both uh, Chair Tyson and Chair Favor for uh, hosting this conversation today. Um, this is such an important conversation as we reimagine public safety as as, a, as council, um, and and I will restate for the public, and I, I said to the mayor and to the police chief, 
Um, creating a true alternative response, uh, crisis response is my number one priority uh, in reimagining public safety. I think that it will save lives uh, and give the residents the response, the appropriate response that they need uh, when they, they are uh, in their, their hour of concern. And so I just appreciate everyone. I appreciate everyone from public health and from uh, the police department, the folks we're going to hear from today uh, who are already starting down this track and council looks forward to being a strong supporter and uh, instigator to continue to move us down this path. Thank you so much, council president Harden. Uh, council member Dorns or Remy? Head, I see head nod, no. All right, we'll keep moving. Uh, and just to remind everyone of how the flow will go tonight, We'll hear a short presentation from our guests. After that, council members will ask questions and uh, there'll be some discussion. The Saunders Company will lead the audience through an engagement activity to help uh, solicit your feedback. And finally, we will hear public testimony. With that, I'll turn the floor over to our first guest to kick us off. Sergeant Matt Harris with the Columbus Division of Police Mobile Crisis Unit, along with Brian Stroh and Michelle Perry with NetCare. Uh, the floor is yours. Council President, uh, Council Members, thank you for having me tonight. Um, so I want to give a brief history of the Mobile Crisis Response Unit that we've got here at Columbus Police in partnership with, with NetCare Access. Um, we've been doing this for a total of about two and a half years. Uh, in summer of 2018, uh, the idea was, was uh, developed to have a corresponding model to respond to mental health crisis scenarios in our community. Um, Columbus Police got together with NetCare and uh, collaborated uh, to where we've got this co-responder model, which we've, uh, we're currently utilizing through today's date, where we have a uh, mental health clinician riding with a CIT trained police officer, and we're in a, a marked police cruiser. We respond citywide and we start at 10 a.m. We go till midnight. The only thing that we do is respond to mental health uh, crisis type calls uh, anywhere in the city. So our calls come in through 911. Our calls uh, might come in through the non-emergency number. Uh, we, we, we take referrals internally from within the police department. We take referrals through net care. We take referrals uh, any way that we can get them. Uh, community members will contact us in various ways to to report that there's a crisis in the community and, and ask us to assist. So we did the pilot for a year. Uh, it worked really well. And summer of 2019, the chief of police approved uh, five police officer positions plus a sergeant to stand up a full-time mental health unit under the Wellness Bureau. Um, NetCare Access dedicated uh, five clinicians to the program full-time to work with the city and we've had great success. Uh, I'll give you some quick numbers and then I want to turn it over to uh, Michelle Perry and, and Dr. Strove from NetCare so they can chime in on this as well. But uh, some some numbers for you. So for the uh, uh, 2020 year, uh, we handled 4,439 calls for service involving uh, persons that are experiencing uh, mental health crisis or scenarios that had a component of mental health crisis. Uh, out of those uh, roughly 4,400 calls, we transported uh, about 1,100 people to what we call a higher level of care, meaning one of the local area hospitals or net care uh, to receive services for, for um, whatever the situation was that they were experiencing at that time. Um, we have had such a success with this program and the clinicians and the officers are so good at de-escalating and having patients that uh, we have had uh, nothing but several um, incidents where we had to 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 maybe uh, grab people and, and possibly put handcuffs on them if they were agitated. But our, our level of force never went beyond a level one and that was only five or six times um, out of those 1,100 calls. We've had great success uh, just convincing people into coming with us without any any violence, uh, without anybody being harmed. And that's that's kind of what I'm proud of with this team. Uh, let me turn it over to um, 
uh, Michelle Perry and Dr. Stroh so they can chime in on this. Thanks, Sergeant Harris. I'll um I'll talk a little bit. I'm Michelle Perry from NetCare. Um, I want to briefly just kind of maybe describe what NetCare access is for those in the public who are not familiar. Um, so NetCare is a um, freestanding psychiatric emergency room, um, and we have been doing and providing crisis services for Franklin County for 48 years. Um, it's a lot of experience in the crisis world, and I think that is why um, this program has been so successful um, because the clinicians that we have paired with this program have multiple years of crisis experience under their belt prior to going on to this team. Um, just a little bit about kind of what NetCare is. Um, what the actual clinicians do on this team is um, once they arrive on the scene, they do a brief assessment with the client. Um, one of the really nice things and the benefits that the clinicians have is, is that they are, um, each one of them has a laptop that is tied to NetCare's electronic health record. So they have 48 years of documentation on these individuals um, prior to sometimes going on these runs or once they get on site. 60% um, of the MCR runs are patients that NetCare has had contact with prior to actually going on these runs. So the reason that's important is, is that our documentation, um, it shows past hospitalizations, diagnoses, history of violence, um, trauma history, any client preferences, do they work better with males, do they work better with females, um, any cultural issues that we need to be aware of. Um, all of those things we can then use to help us in determining a disposition. Um, we also can um, look in our health record to determine if that person is linked with anyone and if they have any significant others or emergency contacts that if we are on the scene, we can reach out to their treatment teams in that moment um, or the on-call teams for those that, that agency. Um, to get some additional baseline information. Is there something going on with this person today um, that maybe led them to this crisis? Um, so basically when we're on scene, the clinician will do a brief assessment. And then with the officer, I just, I wanna stress that this isn't just the clinician making this decision in isolation. Um, sometimes the officers have a better rapport, sometimes the clinicians have a better rapport and the, the team really works well together um, to kind of work with that person and work with the significant others or family members um, to come to a disposition. And that could be leaving the person in the community. Um, about 50% of the runs, a little bit less than that, um, we are able to leave those individuals in the community. Um, that number is slightly lower this year. Um, and the reason for that, we believe, is just due to COVID. Um, and I say that because a lot of individuals were not able to connect with their primary providers. So what these teams are seeing is we're seeing people that when we come into contact with them, they're sicker. Um, they haven't had access to medication or normal appointments. Um, so basically the team will um, determine level of care, whether they can remain in the community, um, if they need to come to net care, um, if they're in need of medical care, um, we can call medics to come out or transport them to a hospital. But overall the goal is always to keep the person in the community um, if we can. If we leave them in the community, um, we do a safety plan with them, um, bringing in any supports, family members, things like that. Um, and then one nice thing, um, these positions are funded by the Franklin County Adam Board on the clinician side. And what the Adam Board has allowed us to do is that we're able to provide um, follow-up with these individuals for 14 days. Um, which is really nice because if they are not linked, um, we can go back out in the community, check on them um, until they make their first appointment, um, or we can make sure that their case manager makes contact with them and then we can close the case. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Stroh. I don't know if you wanna add anything, Dr. Stroh. Uh, I'll add just a little bit. First of all, thank you for having uh, me and us today. Uh, I think uh, uh, Sergeant Harris and Michelle have done a really good job of explaining. I will add a couple things that I think are, are really important, especially as I've, I've heard uh, 
the, the bigger discussion on reimagining public safety. Uh, anybody who's worked in mental health for any period of time becomes very familiar very quickly with the phrase least restrictive environment. And that's the principle that's been at work uh, since deinstitutionalization started occurring in the 1960s. Least restrictive environment means the patient deserves and needs to be, by law, treated in the least restrictive environment. Um, it is an experiment for Columbus and for Franklin County in the past couple uh, of years to try meeting people where they live. That is the least restrictive environment for them. Um, and that has been a real turning point for our community. Uh, it's been a turning point enough that when we started with Columbus, uh, Franklin County sheriffs also wanted to do this. There is a parallel program that exists at the county level uh, with, that, with some slight variations, but the, the theme is essentially the same. And I think that's something that we would all want. We are a society that expects to be able to go seek medical care and psychiatric care is medical care. Uh, substance abuse care is medical care. We expect to be able to meet that on our terms. Um, if I go to the emergency room and it's recommended that A, B, and C happen, I have the right to consent to A, to a and B, but decline C. So to the degree possible, this is one of the first times that we've given this population some real choice uh, as to what happens with them and make them an active participant in their care. Um, that, in my mind, is one of the essences of redefining public safety. Put somebody who's equipped to respond in the field with somebody who then has some choices and allows and, and is allowed to make choices for themselves where they feel autonomous. Um, I, as a psychiatrist, I think it's, and I think as a layperson, it's not hard to understand that the minute we start telling people what to do, things get adversarial. And we really strive to avoid that. Michelle, Sergeant Harris, and their teams have done a phenomenal job of working with patients. Uh, I will blow their horn for them since they didn't bring up some of these numbers, but they are mind blowing. Um, we have arrested, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, less than 1% of uh, mobile crisis runs have resulted in arrest. And I believe those, if I recall correctly, were the officer became aware of felony warrants and there was no way around arresting them. That compares to uh, a much higher percentage in the general population of police runs. We are able to, again, leave half of people in the field. Um, I, I think uh, council's probably aware that there is a new crisis center coming. And one of the, the, the predications of that crisis center is, is that it, it, it's the highway analogy. You can add lanes to the highway all day long, but that doesn't necessarily change the traffic. And one of the things that we really wanna be cognizant of going into the new crisis center is, if we can meet people where they are, we don't have to pack a building full of people when in fact they would probably do same or better in the community with appropriate follow-up. So if I can continue to blow their horn for them, this is a program that really has surpassed people's expectations and by all means, we would love to see it expanded. And with that, I will, I will bid you adieu. Thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for your, your presentations. Uh, it's been incredibly helpful. Uh, before um, I, I jump in with questions, uh, let me turn it over to my colleagues uh, to, to ask questions if they, they do. Councilmember Tyson? Thank you, Councilmember Council Member Favor. Um, Dr. Stroll uh, or either Neckair can answer this. You were just stating that um, you would like to see this program expanded. And so could you talk a little bit about what that expansion would look like? Sure, and I'll let Sergeant Harris jump in here as well because he knows the data at least as well as I do. Um, I believe if I'm recalling the numbers correctly, there's as many as 25,000 calls for service a year that have a mental health component to them. Um, and while 4,500 is an absolutely admirable number, that's essentially one in five or one in six. Um, and going back to my ER analogy, if you go to the emergency room, you, you have every hope of being treated by the most appropriate person. So if we're bringing emergency services to the field uh, and we're saying that we, that 25,000 calls for service have a mental health component, by all means, I would like those folks, every caller to have access to that, understanding that there's a, a process to get there. I, I don't think anybody thinks that's gonna happen overnight, but, but I think in, in anyone's hour of need, they would much prefer to see a, 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 a professional who's dedicated to their particular issue. And I think our residents deserve that. Thank you. So I have another question. I know you just mentioned that your hours were, don't my number, it's like from 10 to midnight. So what happens if there, if someone calls after midnight, between midnight and nine o'clock in the morning? I'll, I'll take, 
Yeah, go ahead, Sergeant Harris. Okay, uh, thank you, Council Member. So if they call outside of the hours that mobile crisis is in operation, um, what happens is uh, the police radio room will try to send a CIT trained officer to the call if it involves a mental health component. Um, if there is, if there are no CIT trained officers available, then they'll send a non CIT trained patrol officer during those non mobile crisis hours. Um, and the way that our numbers are right now, about 50% of the mental health related calls for service that are not handled by MCR are handled by a CIT trained officer. So about half of those calls where, where mobile crisis cannot respond because we're tied up on another run or it's after our hours, um, about half of those calls are handled by um, a CIT trained officer. And then the other half are handled by non CIT. Now it's important to note that the basic police curriculum for Ohio does include um, uh, some mental health training, uh, but certainly, you know, it's beneficial if we can get a CIT trained officer and it's even more beneficial if we can get a mobile crisis team to respond. And, you know, I concur with what Dr. Stroh said, um, you know, his numbers were very close, uh, 22,415 calls uh, for, for uh, in 2020 that involved the mental health component. Um, and, you know, with, with having five mobile crisis teams, um, you know, operating um, limited hours, we simply cannot get to, to all 22,415 of those calls. So any amount of expansion is beneficial because, you know, we would be able to, to increase uh, our numbers, even, and if, even if we're able to increase just a small amount, you know, to me, that's a win. Mm -hmm. The last question, uh, some of my other colleagues, because can um, certainly ask questions. I, I don't know, um, just recently in the news, there was a situation where an individual um, had called for, um, the day ha had called for um, a mental health call, um, a person was in crisis. And the day before they had um, a team like ours went out to the, to the household and was able to keep the gentleman at home. And... Um, and he seemed to be he, he seemed to be okay for that day. The next day he had other issues. And the under, what what we've been seeing on the national news is that the next day there wasn't a uh, a CIT or a um, a mental health professional that went to this household. And make a long story short, um, the individual was killed during that encounter. I'm not saying who's at fault, et cetera, but that they were saying that they called for mental health, someone from a mental health background to come and help their their family members. So this is why I was asking about the expansion because it really is important that when we when calls are being made um, in regard to a person who's in crisis, we really would. I think it's important that we send the right personnel in as much as possible to be able to help those families. I would absolutely agree with you, Councilwoman. And I would add that the the nature of the follow-up is also incredibly important. Um, it is one thing to follow up with the person who you met yesterday, who the family's familiar with, who, who there's a good throughput, there's a good uh, rapport, and there's a good trust level. If that follow-up is uh, perceived as a reinvention of the wheel, um, somebody else was out here yesterday and they don't know, and now today you don't know my story, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have the same medical record. You didn't look at the medical record, something along those lines. That's where things go south really quickly. And that's one of the reasons that we're really uh, big on making sure that there is a follow-up uh, loop in place. If you think about the fact that the team is able to do follow-up on roughly as many people as there were first runs, understanding that first runs have to be prioritized, that's pretty impressive. Um, and it, we, we do credit that with a lot of what keeps people in the field. A single response is one thing, continued response and making sure that person is stable and not simply le left and assumed to be okay uh, is really a focus. Mm -hmm. And it, it, has, it has produced positive results. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Favor. Absolutely. And before I turn it over to my colleagues, um, I wonder, Sergeant Harris, if you could just level set for us because we've thrown CIT out quite a bit. And for our listening and being audience, audience who may not be aware of uh, the technical terms, uh, can you uh, uh, tell us the difference between what is CIT and then the difference between a CI trained and non-CIT trained officer? 
uh, uh, no problem at all, uh, council member. I can answer that for you. So CIT is the crisis intervention team. Um, and what that is, that is a, an, an international model on how you train law enforcement uh, to, to deal with a mental health crisis. The model was invented in 1988. It came out of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, there was an incident where local law enforcement in Memphis had a fatal encounter with an individual who was suffering from severe mental, mental illness. Um, that created a conversation between uh, the uh, Memphis PD uh, police administration and the local mental health community. And eventually they developed a core model of, uh, of training uh, that involved various topics dealing with mental health, with uh, de-escalation, you know, basic understanding of mental illness, those sorts of things. And they developed this 40 hour course, which um, has, has uh, taken off not only around the United States, but it's, it's used in uh, the United Kingdom, it's used in Australia, it's used in Canada. Um, we follow the model here in Columbus. So what that does is it gives a police officer um, greater knowledge than what they probably had before. It is not a magic wand. Um, we, we, we try to be careful when we, when we talk about this training because we, we want to set reasonable expectations. Uh, we're not turning police officers into mental health professionals by any means, but we, what we are doing with CIT is we're trying to give them some groundwork, some basic understanding as to what might be happening, um, create that empathy, so, uh, uh, um, try to teach patients, teach de-escalation. That way, the officers that respond are better equipped to to handle this, this situation. Um, so that's sort of our intermediate response. Um, you know, you've got the basic patrol officer who has some mental health training, and then you have a CIT officer who has more mental health training and then our mobile crisis response teams, um, you know, we have CIT trained officers that, that have uh, a whole lot of experience dealing with mental health related calls for service because that's all we do. And of course, the biggest benefit is that we have a mental health professional in the car with us from NetCare who are able mm -hmm. to do their job. So when you combine the, you know, the highly experienced, uh, you know, police professional who uh, does mental health as their eight or 10 hours a day, and they're not doing anything else. They're just focusing on mental health. You combine that individual with a mental health professional who has the education and the licensure to do that. Uh, you know, we, we've got some, we've had some pretty good results. Yeah, thank you, Sergeant Harris. I think that, um, you know, just kind of level setting is, is incredibly uh, important. Um, I would almost, and you may not be able to answer this question, uh, but, you know, we keep having our, these conversations around reimagining uh, public safety and talking about ways that we can better equip our officers to deal with different types of situations and different types of people and making sure the cultural competencies are there. And so, you know, I would argue that uh, there is absolute value in making sure that every one of every single one of our officers has that CIT training. We're talking about 40 hours of training. And as you indicated, it's not saying that you're a mental health professional, but you know, and maybe I turn this over to our mental health professional, uh, but sometimes, you know, it, it, I would imagine that it would add value to an encounter, um, not knowing that, uh, knowing that every call for service might, you might not know off the top of the head, off your head, that it is a mental health call. Uh, but once you get on site, um, those types of skills and being able to deal with different types of scenarios and people, um, that skill that you may receive during that training could be very helpful for our officers um, in, in the future. So I don't know if, if our mental health professionals have any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, as Sergeant Harris said, I think that the CIT training is great. It gives every officer, you know, unique and different tools for their tool belt, which is which can benefit everyone. Um, I know at NetCare, we um, we had some specialized training. Um, I know Fran Frazier is pretty known in our community. Um, she actually did um, a series of trainings for our management team and then also for our line staff around um, implicit bias, racism, white privilege. Um, and I think that was really um, impactful. I know it doesn't have anything to do with CIT, but but I do think that it, it shows the level of um, dedication that we have to this issue with our clinicians 
Um, and it was it was invaluable um, having her um, come in and do that um, as a service to to our clinicians and to our management team. But I, I do agree, um, CIT is beneficial. Um, as long as the community keeps in mind that the officer, it doesn't make the officer a mental health professional, um, but it does provide them with alternative tools, um, especially around de-escalation and community resources. I would piggyback on what Michelle is saying. And my only caution would be, we have to find the right balance between depending on CIT alone and, and being able to depend on mobile crisis. Um, we, in the same way that you can put any of a number of, of employees in any job through a certain training, and some are more adept than others at the end of that training. This is not a slight of police at all. It's to say that that's a natural human uh, phenomenon, that, that certain people pick up certain things more readily, and certain people are, are able to execute things more readily. So not at all to say that we, we shouldn't look at training more officers for CIT. Absolutely, we should. Uh, but in in the balance of things, we want to make sure we have that balance right. I wholeheartedly agree. But, you know, nothing could be, you know, we would only be moving up where we're at right now because we're asking officers to respond to these types of scenarios knowing that they're not professional, mental health professionals to begin with. So at least we're providing some foundational uh, training uh, that they could at least respond better uh, if they're put in a situation that um, is unique or different uh, than anything else. Uh, let me kick it over to Council Member uh, Dorns uh, to see if he has any additional questions at this time. Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member Favor. Uh, I think this question is for Sergeant Harris. So, you know, as we've sort of uh, had these discussions around sort of the existing infrastructure that exists for having sort of non traditional, you know, responses to mental health calls or others. Um, you know, council has heard from folks in other cities um, as far as what, what they do is providing you know, mental health professionals or other types of, of responses that some include, you know, sworn members of a, of a police force, some don't. Um, and I think one of the things that I've heard a lot from folks in the community both ways is that, um, you know, having a, you know, a sworn officer there, you know, protects the, you know, uh, mental health professional if, if things were to turn um, you know, violent. Um, and then I've also heard from folks in the community as well that say, hey, the very presence of an officer can in and of itself escalate the situation. So, um, you know, as we sort of talk about the success of, of this program in particular in Columbus, in which we have, you know, an officer with, with a professional, I was wondering if you could talk about if, if you have any statistics or anything in which there has, there's, you know, needed to be a intervention from an officer because of the, the situation has become violent. Thank you for the question, council member. Um, the two and a half years that we've been, been doing this, I cannot recall a time where we have been out in the community on the street um, engaging in, in a uh, call for service that involves a mental health component where we've had to jump in and um, you know, kind of save the day where where uh, our civilian partner was potentially going to be assaulted. But there's a reason for that. Um, we do a lot of background work before we respond to the location. So um, I think you heard Michelle Perry and Dr. Stro explain that before or while we're on the way, they're they're using their EHR and they are um, looking up past history. They're they're the key things that we're looking for is a past history of violence. Um, you know, how quickly somebody can decompensate, um, what their prior presentations have looked like, uh, those sorts of things. And then from the police perspective, you know, we are looking at um, all of the usual safety things that we look at as police officers. When, by the time we get there, we usually have a plan in place and we kind of know what we're gonna do and how we're gonna handle it in a way to where we've been able to avoid any incidents, um, you know, that you're asking about. Um, not that, you know, this, not that we'll, we'll, we will be able to avoid that forever, but up to this point, we have been pretty fortunate. Um, some of the, some of the scenarios that involve a very high level of risk, um, we will refer over to probate simply because we don't want to drive our civilian partner to a potential, um, situation where somebody is going to get hurt or killed. So we're very careful about how we respond 
And like I said, we use a lot of, of information that we have. We use all resources that we have to, 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 uh, to try to predict how it's going to go and, and um, mold the best response uh, before we even arrive. Uh, thank you, Sergeant Harrison. Again, to, to Chair Faber's point a moment ago about making sure we're level setting with folks, could you sort of explain that uh, when you mentioned probate? Because I know we've had a couple high profile incidents uh, within the city over the past, I think, 24 months or so in which there has been that kind of uh, issue that, that's gone on. So I wonder if you could just sort of, sort of explain to folks that may be watching uh, because of the mental health component to those types of calls, wh what you mean by that? Uh, you're asking uh, to explain probate? So, like, when you, when you would say, hey, this is not the call that we're going to respond to because of the, the, the nature of um, th their previous involvement with, with the you know, so court system, that uh, what if you could just speak to that for a moment? Uh, yes, absolutely. So a typical example of that would be an individual who we know is armed or likely to be armed, um, you know, past history of violence, um, they have assaulted. Uh, law enforcement in the past, they've assaulted uh, others in the past. Um, we simply don't want to drive uh, our civilian partner, you know, being our, our mental health clinician to that location and and hope for the best. There are some scenarios, you know, mostly involving weapons and uh, firearms specifically, where, you know, we don't want to expose our civilian partners to that. So uh, there are times where we, mobile crisis will still go and we'll be backed up by patrol and we'll kind of, you know, try to leave our mental health folks off in the background at a safe distance. But there are other times where we make the decision that, you know, we need to pass this one off to probate. Um, and um, that doesn't happen very often, but occasionally we will get a scenario that's just, we feel is too high risk to, to bring our, our, our net care folks um, to the scene. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. I, I think just to underscore just my questions with you. So one, that situation is extremely rare if I'm hearing you correctly. And then two, um, as far as the the component of how uh, these teams have been deployed uh, to date, and again, hopefully this continues, there has not been you know any any type of violence that has been you know um, needed to be interceded by by the officer. So the the mental health professionals that are there have been able to do their job, do their job safely with positive results is, is that fair to say it is fair to say i do know that you know there's been um several instances where our officers have had to um uh, grab individuals who were in the middle of the street attempting to get hit by a car um, where the clinicians were nearby but i can't think of anything uh and michelle and and doc correct me if i'm wrong here but i i can't think of any scenarios where um you know, there was kind of a near disaster that happened involving a clinician where they they were, um, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, injured. I, I, I think we've been pretty good about uh, protecting our civilian partners. Yeah, Sergeant Harris, I think you're right. I think I, I can recall a couple of situations um, that were close calls, uh, meaning that um, the officer had asked the clinician to remove themselves from the situation because the, the client was becoming more escalated um, by which the officers then had to kind of de-escalate the situation on their own. And that was more of a precautionary thing. Um, there have been some, um, what I would consider close calls, um, not often, um, but they stand out in my head just because that's not the world that social workers normally live in. Um, and I would say just to kind of clarify with a probate question, um, the reason that sometimes, or the reason these cases can potentially become um, more dangerous is because of, when someone is probated, what that means is, is that they are, they're involuntarily not wanting to come in for treatment. So that means that a judge has ordered them in for treatment, which means law enforcement then has the ability to actually breach their, their home, their door, their dwelling, and bring them in for an evaluation. So if you can imagine someone who sometimes doesn't believe there's a mental illness um, or they have a mental illness or they're so decompensated that they're not able to care for themselves um, and the officers do have to actually then breach to come to have, not all the time, sometimes they can go in and the person will voluntarily go with them. But anytime you're dealing with an involuntary situation that does, that does increase the risk. 
I would add one thing to that, not to belabor this, but the other uh, point at hand here is, is that NECAIR is the designated probate pre-screening authority for Franklin County. And so we are able to close that loop internally in, in a pretty unique way. So the, the, when we say that something's being referred to probate, it's not that this team is punting per se, it's that it makes it another to another uh, segment of net care where we interact with the courts and see if, the, if a judge or magistrate agrees that they need to be brought in. It actually allows us to close the loop rather than, than any, any sense that we're punting it. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for their piece of sort of the answer to that, that puzzle. Uh, I think it's really important as council sort of considers, again, the subject of this hearing, you know, sort of alternative responses. What does that mean? And sort of when we think about, um, you know, people traditionally think you call 911 because something's dangerous. Um, that's not always the case about how someone's perceiving the world in front of them. And that's not always the best response. Um, so for us to better understand uh, how this has worked in, in this uh, in this particular case, I think is very important for us. So uh, with that, I turn it back to Council Member Favor. Thank you. And I know that we're um, running on time. So I just, I have a, a follow-up question. Um, you know, Dr. Strahi, you mentioned uh, wanting to see an expansion of the program. Um, so, you know, I pose this question uh, to uh, you, Sergeant, uh, if, you, if you do know, what type of additional resources would it take to scale this program for Columbus? I'm sorry, that's to me or to Sergeant Harris? Sergeant Harris. Okay. Oh, okay, uh, thank, thank you, Council Member. Um, I, I think at this point, it, it's hard to say exactly how many additional teams we would need to be able to handle these calls for service. I will say this, I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to have enough resources to handle all 22,415 um, calls for service that are coming in. Now, keep in mind also that that number has steadily increased over a three year period. So we started measuring these numbers in 2017. Um, each year from 2017 to present, that number, that 22,000 has gone up by two to 3,000. So, um, as we move along, go into the future, that number is only going to increase. So I don't know that there's an exact number, but what I would say is, you know, any amount of, of expansion that, that, that we can be afforded is going to be beneficial. Um, I, I, I don't think we're ever going to have enough uh, resources to handle all of the calls, but, you know, at this point, I'll take, um, I'll take whatever I can get. <laughs> I think that, that whatever whatever can be provided uh, is going to be a benefit to the community. And then the, the last question, and it's more of a statement, so to speak. You know, I personally have uh, been um, present uh, during a, a situation where someone was experience, was in crisis uh, and having to make that decision on whether or not uh, to to put a call out. Uh, with the concern that it could turn um, um, ugly very quickly uh, if we're just being candid. And I have uh, spoken to many residents who have made that same comment to me. And so as we're thinking about alternative crisis uh, response methods, figuring out how we can streamline these calls, uh, that if we know for sure that it's a mental health concern, that they would go directly to you all um, I think that there's a lot of um, fear out there that, you know, by dialing 911, uh, the wrong team uh, could go out. Or if it is after hours and we happen to get a non-CIT trained person, that it could escalate uh, in a negative uh, way in which uh, Councilmember Tyson uh, depicted earlier. So I just wanting to continue to press, um, you know, us thinking outside of the box and creatively uh, to really uh, deal in on this issue. So thank you all for your presentations and, and your comments uh, this evening. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Council Member Tyson. Thank you, Council Member Favor. And I have one more question, just following up on your just last comment. What's the diversity of the, um, the team, either from neck care that goes out as well as um, um, on the team of our police officers? from male, female, you know, um, in terms of, of race, ethnicity. Can you share that? 
I, I, I can, uh, council member. So currently we have um, six sworn Columbus police officers. That includes myself. Um, five out of those six are white males. Um, we do have one African-American uh, member of our team. Uh, with uh, the clinicians, the demographics are um, mixed. We have uh, males, we have females. Uh, and uh, at this point, I think um, um, you know we could we could certainly benefit from from greater diversity. But this is this is where we're at, you know, currently. And and um, uh, that's not a slight towards anybody because everybody that we have does a fantastic job. Um, but certainly, you know, I've always believed that if you go into a certain community with a certain demographic, that 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 it's human nature to to relate to people who have the same background, maybe the same, uh, you know, cultural upbringing as what you do. People tend to gravitate towards like people. So I'm always open to the idea of, of uh, you know, increasing our, our uh, diversity on the team. I'll just add to you, we do have um, a little more diversity on the CID team and our, um, our manager on the clinical side um, is a black female. Um, so I just wanted to kind of add that, um, that we do have a little bit more, but we always can do better, um, in that area. And, and thank you. The only reason I asked the question, certainly I think you realize just the diversity of our community, but I also realize that, um, that we certainly need more professionals within the behavioral health field that are diverse. So I certainly wasn't taking that as a slight. I was just trying to have a better understanding of who's on the team and and um, and how do we how do we move forward to making it more diverse as we um, continue this relationship. So thank you. I um, I'm sorry. And now I will. Um, and so um, I will now like to. Um, just ask my speakers to get ready to present, but in the 2021 budget, which is not passed yet, there's a proposal that will involve Columbus Public Health partnering with public safety also. This would, this would entail licensed social workers teaming up with the crisis intervention trained officers, as you heard just a few minutes ago, to respond to mental health related requests. To further discuss the proposal from Columbus Public Health, we have um, Anita Clark, the Assistant Health Commissioner of Administration, and Marion Stuckey, Section Chief of the Neighborhood Social Services. Anita and Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council Member Tyson. I really appreciate the opportunity here. And I just want to briefly go over um, what we have in our budget for uh, 2021, as you mentioned, it hasn't passed yet, um, but we have new funding for 1.8 million, which is, would include hiring 20 social workers, and th that would also include vehicles for those social workers. Um, we're happy to say um, that we have already submitted uh, for a program manager position this week internally. We should have that externally posted by the end of the week. Um, so we're really um, moving forward with that position. Um, and really our goal is to be working with our CPD and our EMS and providing um, emergency response in the community. We've had some wonderful meetings so far with CPD. Um, and then on this Friday, we have a meeting with CPD and EMS to talk further about our uh, project timeline and when we can think we can have the teams develop. And Mary and I have, have been talking about this for a long time now, and we're so excited about it. And we really believe our biggest challenge is going to be hiring the diverse um, clinical social workers that we need to hire. Uh, I've already been in touch with our um, ODI department to see if we have some options and Marion has some ideas. That, I believe, is probably going to be our biggest challenge. Um, Marion, um, today, and I have to thank Sergeant Harris, he's been fantastic to work with, spent the day with him um, with their um, programming, um, with their um, MRC programming today. And I just think that's wonderful that she's got the opportunity to do that and spend the whole day kind of looking at what they do, because that's going to be very helpful as we build up our programming with the 20 social workers. 
Um, so, Marion, would you like to give a little bit more insight in your experience today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank right. you, Anita. So today, I also want to thank Sergeant Harris for the opportunity to shadow the team for most of the day. And what I can largely say is what struck me is just the treating people like human beings and giving them dignity and choice um, in the interactions that I, I witnessed. So it, it was just a really powerful experience. and. Again, as Anita shared, we're really excited to, to be able to partner and to continue to bring services to people, which is definitely a mainstay of the programs that I oversee, and um, just continuing to, to be a bridge and to be a support in the community. So I, I would like a little more information. So I know that we just talked about the Mobile Crisis Response Unit with NetCare and um and cpd and then we you know mentioned that the, our cit trained officers are going to go out can you just really talk a little bit could you just you know share a little bit about what the role is of the, of the social workers um going out with the cit team yeah so the role will be to um similar to what's been shared just to continue to assess to expand the team diversity to um, connect with resources, um, to do, again, do that brokerage part to make sure people are connected to what they need, um, just can, to do crisis intervention. Um, I would say those would be the, the majority of the services we would provide. Um, we have linkage to longer term services too, and we've worked really hard to connect around different, different issues, for example, like housing issues and, um, you know, generous, general issues that, that come up. So I would say just continuing to be a resource and continuing to assess and get people where they need to be would be our primary focus. We, we do have um, a couple peers that we've been talking to uh, Sergeant Harris about really consider the first responder and the second responder um, team. And the first responder would actually go out with behind the CPD officer um, they wouldn't ride with the officer, but would have a vehicle that they would follow them out to um, the, the resident's home. And that would be, you know, with the CPD and EMS and the social worker. And then we would have a second responder where we would hope to have somebody that would be providing acuity to the phone calls, the 911 calls that come in. So that if they would, for example, if they had somebody that they knew had some, um, maybe they've made threats to their life, but they've never been harmful to anybody, that we could dispatch a social worker and EMS to that home. As Mary and I have talked, and I think that it was mentioned today um, that Dr. Stroh, you had been mentioned, that when you show up sometimes with a CPD officer, that often escalates the situation that if we already know ahead of time that that's not going to be helpful and we can send a social worker out in the EMS, that may be more beneficial. Of course, making sure that, you know, the acuity level of a call is appropriate um, for, the, for that team to go out without a CPD. All right. And you also just mentioned that you would be um, connecting them to long-term services that, um, a family may need because generally when you do have many families in crisis that there are other services that 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 um, how do we help that family to move forward, especially if they're having a family member that is in a crisis situation. Um, so you would also be helping to provide those services to the family. Is that correct, Marion? Yes, that's correct. So um, as you're familiar with the care coalition, we have a great resource and network of providers that we could make that we can make connections to in an expedited fashion. So just really um, it being able to quickly connect and uh, rely on our network that we've already established to be able to do so. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues? So uh, thank you, Council Member Tyson. Uh, and thank you, ladies, uh, for uh, presentation. So uh, just wanting to make sure um, we're clear here, the social workers will work uh, complementary to, with, alongside the uh, mobile crisis unit and, and not respond with the unit per se. Uh, they'll, they'll follow in a, in a separate vehicle. Is, is that how it will actually play out if need be? 
Yes, that is my understanding at this time. And, you know, I've been working with Sergeant Harris, and I, I think that that's, you know, we would not be riding along with the police officer in their car, but behind them um, in that first responder situation. So I can't help but, you know, think about, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm very excited about uh, the, the um, what this could, the, 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 what this program could really do, uh, the impact that it could have in our communities. Um, but uh, we, and, and I'm excited that we have uh, 20 social workers that will be designated to service this area. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that we only have uh, a, a five team officer, well, technically six if we include Sergeant Harris. So how will that hearing actually work? I'm going to have to turn that over to Sergeant Harris to answer. Um, Sergeant Harris, do you have any additional information you want to provide on that? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Anita. So I, I think that, that right now we're, we're trying to, to work through all of these, these different ideas and, and we're not 100% sure you know, how it's going to look operationally. Um, uh, my understanding was that we, we would have uh, you know, we would sort of, of continue the same model that we have now, the co-responder model. Um, I think that it could get a little tricky if, if we're trying to follow each other in another vehicle. But again, you know, these are these are things that haven't been solidified yet. So we're trying to work through these ideas. Um, okay, you know, I, you. I would I would I would say that, um, you know, I think uh, practically speaking, it 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 would be um it might be difficult to have uh, a couple of or it might be difficult to have a car following a police car uh, just because of traffic and whatnot but those are things that again we're working through and trying to um uh you know to come up with a with a plan and so this is where it would really be um you know i think if we go back to what my original question was or just about what it would take to scale up the mobile crisis unit uh, so that, you know, these these entities would match, you know, more or less, that if we, we had a robust, um, and, we, and, and I, I don't mean that as a slight or anything, I'm not trying to be facetious, uh, but just recognizing the need over 22,000 calls uh, and, and we're able to respond to just, you know, around 4,000-ish, you know, if we were able to uh, really uh, double or even triple those numbers, um, to match what we've got going with the social workers here, uh, you know, what kind of impact could we truly have in, in this particular space? So um, thank you, thank you, ladies, for your presentation, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Member Councilor Tyson. Thank you. So, Maria and Anita, thank you for your presentation. And at this time, I'd like to open up with my colleagues of our answer questions. And so, if there are no other questions, I would now um, like to turn it over to the Saunders Company to walk us through an, a, an audience engagement exercise so we can hear from any, everyone participating at home. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Saunders. Thank you so much, Chair Tyson, Chair Favor. Council members Dorans and Remy, thank you so much for having us here this evening. We are really excited about the opportunity to share with you and to engage with you in this exercise. Before we get started, there's a couple of things we're going to need you to do for those of you who are listening on Facebook, on YouTube, and those who are attending the meeting. We need you to go to www.menti.com. That's menti, M-E-N-T-I.com. And once you get there, you're going to put in this code. It's 85904478. And so we're going to give you just a moment to get there. Again, you're going to menti.com, 85904478. And Angela, if you would please uh, give the screen to Cheryl so she can share our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll just wait for one moment. There we are. Thank you. So tonight, it, we you heard the very deliberate and engaged conversation about 
alternative public safety crisis response options, what we're doing in the city, new programs that are coming online. And so that's what our exercise is all about this evening. Again, you're going to menti.com. And when you get to that code, you're going to put in 85905478. And so we'll go to our first question. Our first question is, after you've heard the conversation this evening, how would you define alternative crisis response? And again, this is about how you think about alternative crisis response. How would you define it? Um, we want you to really think uh, deliberately. Um, thank you, thank you. And so as you provide your responses, as you can see, we will see them online. Also, we want to remind our uh, members who are on Facebook, those who are following us on Facebook, this is an opportunity for you to voice, uh, lift your voice, as well as those who are on YouTube. And we know there are a few people who have some watch parties going on, so we want you to participate as well. So um, this is about alternative crisis response. What do you think? How do you define that? And we see them coming in, 911 diversion programs second responders to de-escalate crises. And we've talked about that this evening. You heard our council members and our speakers, um, presenters talk about that. A response focused on mental health, wellness instead of criminal behavior. Non-police crisis response, solely focused on social workers and other mental health professionals. Eliminating police intimidation an opportunity to engage with an individual in mental health crisis with a ha without having to respond by utilizing our traditional law enforcement responses, which is what's been talked about this evening. Oh, they keep coming. We have about one minute to go. We talk about homeless outreach and social worker and how that mobile crisis response team can be so important. Someone specialized in certain discipline responding. Something that needs more money put behind it in order to be used more efficiently. More mobile crisis uh, units. And, and, and we talked about that given the numbers that we heard this evening. We have about 30 more seconds. And thank you for your responses. Uh, please keep them coming. social workers dealing with all types of homelessness complaints. Very good. Cheryl, do you see more coming in or are we ready to We're steady? Okay. So with that, we'll go to our next question. And this is something that we want you to really be visionary and really think about um, this is your opportunity to say how you would spend money to establish a crisis response. And so how should the city of Columbus spend more on what? What is that? This is your vision. This is your opportunity to give your voice to recommendations to establish crisis response. What do you think? Where should uh, the focus be? Where should the investment be? What are your thoughts around that? And we have about 90 seconds uh, for your thoughts. Some of these are, are, are similar to before, but again, this is an opportunity to be visionary, to really think of what you heard this evening, to think about what you know, other cities are doing and how should uh, we spend our investment? De-escalating training, more mental health training, more clinicians along with so more mental health clinicians along with social workers. Invest in all of the resources required from 911, 311, patrol and, and the list continues. Thank you all for these ideas. Understand how 988 
is probably going to change what calls go into 911. Very specific training. More call takers, both at 911 and the non emergency line. Crisis prevention. More counselors. Fun exempt the existing proven models that uh, for net care and CBD, CPD, and also think about our young people. More money toward mental health professionals. We have about 30 more seconds here. More the mobile crisis unit keeps coming up as an opportunity. Community block watch support, something different we haven't heard in our meetings before. Thank you. Reliable interpretation services, something we have heard in community uh, meetings before, the importance of that interpreter. So more of those. Long-term resources, not episodic, but really make this long-term and sustainable. Uh, spend more on programs like MCR. Training for citizens, regular citizens, when to call police. That's an interesting um, observation. Thank you. Thank you all. More racial and linguistic diversity. Thank you. And so quite, quite unique responses that have been different from what we've received before. So thank you so much. And now we'll go to our next question. This one is similar, but we're talking more about alternative crisis response should the city invest in. And so some of these examples might be the mobile crisis unit, and you've mentioned some of those tonight. Uh, anything that you know about what's happening nationally around the cities, I think this question is very similar to the one we had before. So if anything different comes to mind, this is an opportunity. Non-police units. Oh, very. Thank you. React. Thank you. These are the alternative programs we're, we're thinking through. Mental health and substance abuse are two sides of the same coin. Anything else? Mental health work and school programs. Bringing that collaboration together. Crisis prevention intervention training for anyone and everyone. More shelter spaces. And we see the uh, REACT and that we, we're familiar with that program. Affordable housing and good paying jobs, seeing that this also can have an impact on crisis response. Thank you for that. We know the social determinants of health and how that plays a role in some of these um, challenges that we face as a community. And so we always uh, know that that is certainly top of mind with our members of city council and uh, the city of Columbus and Columbus Public Health. Mobile crisis, we, we get that. A community mental health team with social workers and nursing staff providing those resources and medication education and compliance, very unique. One model with correspondence and another with social workers, only to respond to the two levels of calls. Non-police response as done in other cities. We have about 20 more seconds. Non-lethal weapon uh, responses. Affordable housing, we, we, we've seen that one. Services for children in crisis. That's something that we keep hearing. We need to focus on our youth as well. And that um, is our time for this. And so thank you so much for those responses. We have one final question. And again, it's big vision. Anything that you've not uh, mentioned before, um, this is your opportunity to add any additional comments that you'd like to add. 
I do want C city council to uh, remember, to respond to, to think through. Any other uh, responses or information that you wanna share with uh, members of Columbus City Council? And as you share these, we want you to know that all of this is being captured. Uh, the City Council has charged us with making sure that we capture all of the comments from these meetings, as well as those from the survey, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as those from our focus groups. So um, this will be a public document uh, once this process has been completed. And so this information is something that um, is very critical and very important to members of City Council. A no wrong door approach that delivers patient to an expanded mental health substance abuse system that can accommodate them promptly. And that word promptly is, um, has been added. Thank you. People can call in a crisis and be ensured safety for themselves, for the person they called. And this includes sensitive domestic violence situations as well. I want my husband and son to be safe from racism and racist police. So um, having people and resources to help in crisis situations that are not just police officers, but highly trained social workers and mental health professionals. A civilian team created that knows the community by providing education, resources, and direction during a vulnerable situation. And we talked about the 988 to be 911 of mental health. We have about 30 more seconds. And so anything else you'd like to add is your opportunity to do so. And thank you, Facebook participants and YouTube participants. We really appreciate your uh, participation this evening. That the city and residents commit themselves to investing the time, the energy, the resources for a safer community for all types of emergencies, including mental health and social and welfare. And so thank you so much for your um, engagement this evening. As I mentioned, we will capture all of these and, and summarize and include this in a final comprehensive report. And so with that, uh, Cheryl, if you could go to our next slide. We want you to know that um, there is a survey out there for you to take as well, and we are looking for your uh, participation in that. If you go to columbus.gov backslash reimagine safety, you can get to that survey. You can also share that with your family members, with your friends, because the more information that Columbus City Council receives from you and hears your voice, it will help them as they move into their budget decision making. And then our next slide, we want you to also know that if you have any other comments that you didn't think about this evening and you want to share them, please send those comments to reimaginesafety at columbus.gov. Reimaginesafety at columbus.gov. And with that, uh, we wanna thank you for your time this evening. And Chair Favor, I think I turn it back over to you. Yes. yes, thank you so much, Ms. Saunders, and thank you to your team for uh, leading another robust uh, interactive session. Uh, and I just want to take a point of privilege and thank our residents uh, for engaging with us uh, this evening. As Ms. Saunders indicated, all of this information is being captured uh, for us to revisit, but we truly do appreciate your time on a Wednesday evening. Uh, you could be doing anything, but thank you for uh, engaging with Council Member Tyson and I. Um, and with that, we will move into the uh, public testimony portion of the evening. Uh, I'll call your name and council staff will unmute uh, the speakers. Uh, you will each have three minutes to speak. Uh, there will be a, a, a buzz, a ding, uh, that will let you know uh, when your time has been uh, completed. And so with that, we will kick it off. And I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Lalitha Pamidikadam. I know I butchered that. Hi, yes, it's Lalita Pamidigantam. Um, thank you so much. That is okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, hello, and thank you for having me at this town hall tonight. My name is Lalitha Pamidi Guntam, and I'm the policy analyst for the YWCA Columbus, who I'm representing tonight. Our mission statement is to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote justice, peace, freedom, and dignity for all. Today, I want to focus on that third part of the mission statement, considering that we work with a very vulnerable population of women and families. We are in need of using police for our own safety and the safety of our residents. Anecdotally, however, we have evidence that we desperately need the police um, for our safety, but our staff still doesn't really have faith in the police institution to mediate these situations when we need mental or physical health assistance. I'm glad to hear tonight that there seems to be attention to expanding the mobile crisis response unit because in all the time that this has been active our social workers have reported that they have never once interacted with that team that's why i'm here today we commend city council on your efforts to properly address the racial strife of this past summer however we know that this is not a new issue or an issue that can be solved with budget alone considering that there are seemingly so few police officers who are few, uh, well trained in mental health it is astonishing that we have let the police become the first response to mental health calls in the first place this can feel threatening to those who are already feeling traumatized we need to change the system so that either all police officers are fully trained with a standardized method of addressing mental health concerns or fund more specialized units to respond to every single mental health call. Earlier, the sergeant said that there probably wouldn't be enough resources for this, but I'd like to ask why. If we're so committed as a city, then why can't funding for this model be prioritized over traditional uh, responses, which we know cause harm? I want to emphasize that from hearing from our staff, we know that there, the police, um, there have been police who have responded well and were helpful. Our staff even requests those police officers every single time because too often we are overwhelmed with bad experiences with little to no recourse. We keep hearing the sentiment um, that it's just a few bad apples, but I hope you know that the saying goes, of it's um, a few bad apples spoils the whole bunch. Considering the experiences of our staff, it seems like we should really be saying that there are only a few good apples, actually. We'd like to see this change in a standardized model um, of, to respond to mental health calls with trained professionals and replace forceful interactions um, with those with social workers or people who are otherwise trained by police or hold them accountable after committing the murder to see tangible outcomes of dismantling the process of violent police interactions and replacing them with people who are trained in mental health and actually need to respond that way. We know that this is what council and what the greater public wants as well. So we are hoping that justice will be served and we hope that we can change our systems and how police interact with the vulnerable and that we can make these adjustments speedily. We know from our history of the civil rights era that justice delayed is justice denied. And let us apply that lesson here. We look forward to what council can what council does to continue around this topic, and I plan to keep to, to keep a very close eye on the development of alternative safety methods. I personally am looking forward to working with each and every one of you in the coming months to ensure the delivery of justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that testimony uh, this evening and for your work uh, that you're doing uh, to to serve our. A most vulnerable population. Uh, council members, do you have any questions? Thank you again for, for your advocacy. And I, I let me uh, also kick it over to our officers if they had any um, direct response. Okay. All right. Thank you again for that testimony. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Claire Decker. Claire with us this Hi evening. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. The floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Councilmember Faber and Councilmember Tyson, for holding this meeting. Uh, we very much appreciate your leadership in this area. Uh, as was said, my name is Claire Decker, and I am here representing the Columbus Safety Collective, which is a community think tank dedicated to promoting non-carceral safety interventions for increased neighborhood well-being in Columbus. Um, so our group has heard broad support from many areas, including um, Columbus Police, Public Health, um, several other community stakeholders for um, alternative crisis response. So we know that we're headed in the right area having these conversations. Um, we also understand that as the 2021 budget is soon to be solidified, the time is now to consider three different pieces in this area, which would be the MCRU crisis response um, expansion, which we've heard a lot about tonight, um, as well as a long-term follow-up and connection of resources for folks that are in crisis. And then finally, a civilian or a non-police response pilot, which was discussed at length in the previous town hall on this topic, uh, led by Council President Hardin. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how important it is that this non-police pilot um, needs enough resources 
to build out a program that is um, data driven and able to be statistically significant in our understanding of how it works, if it works, and our ability to compare it to MCRU, co-response, what we see in other cities, et cetera. We really need a health-centered approach um, without the law enforcement present. And I wanted to touch a little bit, um, Councilmember Doran's asked a question earlier about safety for civilian responders. And I just had one more thing to add. Um, we've been looking at a lot of other cities that have similar co-responses and non-police response teams. One of those is Cahoots that we've heard about in Oregon. And just to give you an idea, um, Sergeant Harris had talked about how we haven't run into an issue with serious injury, harm, or death of a civilian responder. And um, Cahoots, which has been running this for much longer, has similar um, data to support that, so that these folks really aren't in grave danger because we do the work on the front end to ensure. So in 2019, um, the CAHOOTS teams requested police backup only 150 times, which was less than 1% of their 24,000 calls that year. So just wanted to touch a little bit about the research we found in that. Um, going back to some of the pieces we heard from those um, community responses that you all are collecting in these town halls, um, you know, the pie in the sky approach to this really is that we're hearing from the community is that every individual experiencing these crises deserve to be answered by appropriately trained professionals who can address the situation effectively without violence or use of excessive force and be connected to resources for long term health. Um, we need to be meeting people where they are with no excessive violence. And that should be our goal. Um, hearing a little bit about the expansion when we talk about MCRU expansion. You know, we understand, I think everyone here on this call understands that expansion is a process and, um, but I think it's important to realize that the goal shouldn't be slighted before we even go for it. The idea um, that some percent under 100 would be appropriate for these responses to go out to, that's not a goal that's worth standing behind. The goal should be that eventually, in some way, 100% of mental health calls are responded to with appropriately trained professionals. To end, I'd just like to say it's time for a bold vision for Columbus safety. Not starting from nothing here. Um, we have a co-response model and we have best practices from others that have been brave enough to implement alternative crisis response before us and we can work through those. Thank you again for your leadership and we look forward to continuing to work in this area. Thank you, Ms. Decker, and, and good to hear from you again. Uh, I, just a follow up, I, I know that you, um, your group advocates uh, in, in three areas, but because uh, follow up has come up uh, during tonight's town hall, I wonder from your perspective, what long term, what a long term follow up strategy would look like? Uh, would that be um, something that could work uh, squarely within the social work uh, worker element that we're looking to build out? Um, do we press a little bit more uh, for our officers and, and, and our net care individuals? Um, how do you see that playing out in your eyes? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'd actually like to hear um, the perspectives on that from some of the experts that are here from net care and, and from public health as well. Um, I think from what we've heard through some of the research that we've done, we know that the follow up is hard to keep up with. And it's not that the MCR teams don't want to it's just the time and resources that are that are required for that so i think um you know th this is something that you know i wanted to hear about in coming to this meeting is we've known we've been hearing um that 20 clinicians number has been bopping around in lots of these conversations that we've been a part of and and exactly what that's going to look like still seems to be a bit of an unknown which um you know it, it seems that lots of folks are working in that space um i'm thinking that that's a question for the folks that are doing that work that are going to be employing those social workers and what that might look like for them. Um, and that's a question that CSC has had for a while is, is are some of those folks kind of helping with long term response and building that out because we know that our current response isn't able to provide that for all of the folks that they're uh, responding to or is the expansion of that first responder. The most important is it rolled into the same folks. Um, so yeah, I guess we have those same questions that, that you're bouncing around. Thank you so much. And, and definitely not uh, wanting to put you on the spot or anything, but just looking to gather other 
uh, other opinions and thoughts as we uh, continue to work through this, these models. Council members, do you have any questions for uh, Ms. Decker? Thank you so much uh, for your advocacy and uh, this conversation continues to be ongoing. Up next, we have Leah Bevis. Can you hear me? Leah? Yes, we can. The floor awesome. is yours. Thank you so much, Council Member Favor. Um, again, I, I also want to really thank you for your leadership in this area. It's exciting to see how many Council Members are on this call at once, like you and Council Member Tyson, other people who aren't even leading this. So I, I really take that as a sign of your guys' commitment to this area, and that's that's really exciting. Um, so. I've met a few of you already. I'm an economist at OSU, and I'm also working with the Columbus um, Safety Collective that, that Claire, Claire is also part of. And we've also been meeting with folks um, from NetCare, from Adam H, from CPD, from a long list of professionals for other mental health organizations, crisis response organizations. So I want to ask a series of questions that, related, that are sort of directed to the panel of experts and, and the rest of City Council. So I'll just go through the questions. but. Um, you, you could feel free to break in, but I'll, I'll sort of go through them and otherwise you can think about whether you have any thoughts on that at the end. So first, it's clear that City Council wants to expand clinician involvement in mental health and substance crisis in Columbus. And you guys are talking about these clinicians. And I just want to conceptually separate three possible roles for these clinicians, all of which have been discussed tonight and also last week. So the first is that clinicians can join police in a co-response model of crisis response. That's what we already have in the mobile crisis response program that's led by Sergeant Matt Harris. Second, clinicians perhaps partnered with paramedics, as mentioned earlier, um, or other, other partners could respond to crisis without police. That's a non-police response model. This is what cities like Albuquerque, Eugene, Denver, Austin are piloting, or what LA, New York, and San Francisco have just committed to. Third, clinicians can help with follow-up after crises, right? So these guys are not first responders per se. They're not there the first time, but they're a critical component of alternative mental health crisis response. So I guess my first question is, how does City Council plan to allocate resources across these three types of tasks? And a sort of sub-question from that, an implicit part of that, is do you plan to pilot a new non-police response program, a first responder program that uses clinicians, maybe other people, but not police, in responding to mental health and behavioral crises in 2021? So my second um, point relates to the MCR program. Sergeant Matt Harris has mentioned that expanded the Expanding the program too much or too quickly could be difficult. Um, this makes sense, and different perspectives might, different stakeholders might have different perspectives about how fast the MCR program should expand, how large initial non-police response pilot should be. But I think we can all agree, as Claire said, that it has to be our goal to answer 100% of mental health and substance-related crises with an appropriate response by healthcare professionals sometime in the near future. Not 5%, not 20%, not even 90%, 100% of people in crisis deserve this. And so I'd like to know what City Council's long-term goal for answering mental and behavioral crisis calls. What do you guys visualize our city's crisis response looking like in 10 years? So third, you, you folks have discussed a lot today the history and value of CIT training. It's great that CPD now requires CIT training of all new recruits. However, we also wanna point out the officers who work with the MCR program don't do any further training. They, they only have that CIT training. So I, I would ask sort of Matt Harris and, and others, what, what are the plans for training MCR officers in the future? Um, additionally, um, Ms. Michelle Perry points out that net care clinicians having access to previous health data is really helpful. I've heard that from a number of people. But it is hard to coordinate across different organizations, Concord Counseling, Southeast, NetCare. So in the long run, what sort of sort of large organization collaborative data record sort of system would you guys like to put in place in order to more effectively deliver healthcare and also follow up? And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for uh, your, your questions this evening. Uh, there were quite a few there. Um, so I will, um, I, I will turn it over to my, my colleagues to provide their, their own uh, individual responses. I think from my perspective, uh, we're in the middle of reviewing the operating budget right now. Uh, and we're having these conversations uh, so that we can make informed decisions about how uh, to, to properly 
uh, fund some of the models that you have, um, you know, discussed uh, in, in your testimony. That is really what the reason behind this, and 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 because we want to provide the best uh, service um, that is based in and humanity and equity for our residents. So. Um, I don't have a, uh, an exact answer for you uh, at this moment uh, because we're still in the, in the midst of this, this process. Um, you also asked a question about what our 10-year uh, plan for crisis response. Obviously, I want to be able to uh, meet that goal of, you know, providing 100% of the crisis response uh, based on the exact need that is made at that moment. That would be my pie-in-the-sky goal for 10 years. Um, but things are changing um, every single day uh, in, in our community. The needs of our community are, are changing so rapidly. Uh, and so there is a de definitely the need for uh, there to be some flexibility in that goal. Uh, but I, I want uh, our um, alternative crisis response to, to be the model uh, for how we uh, deal with um, issues around mental health, uh, drug uh, overdose, uh, or just safety concerns in general. Um, I'm more of in the camp of truly reinvesting in our community. So changing this conversation from just safety and policing to truly investing in um, our nonprofits, into our education, into our housing, uh, into providing job opportunities uh, to better uplift our residents uh, who have felt like they have been left behind. Um, so that's just my take. Uh, I'll allow uh, my council members to hop in there with their uh, opinions. Thank you, Councilmember Favor, and um, and I certainly do appreciate um, the significant number of questions and certainly the thought that has gone into those questions to ask this body. I would just say that um, for me, when we're talking about reimagining um, safety in, in our community, I would agree with council member favor. It really is for me looking at the looking at the, the social determinants of health. And that's and, and because safety is is yeah, I know oftentimes you won't look we won't look at safety strictly from a policing standpoint. And it's just not just policing. It is, like I said, the social determinants of health. And one of those happen to be, you know, we gotta make sure people are safe by having a place to live. And we have to make sure they're safe by having food to eat, right? Getting their education, having jobs. It's so we need to look at we need to look at um, how do we look about enhancing the quality of life of individuals in our community, and that does include the um, when individuals are calling out because they they're having. Um, they're in a mental health crisis, who are the appropriate people to go out and to be able to, to make sure that that family and that individual feels like they're getting the very best care of um, service coming from the city of Columbus. So I think that having this meeting today and all the other meetings we've had, we're getting a lot of inf great information from, from our residents to provide us with information and data to help us to look at what do we do to again enhance the quality of life of all of our residents. I truly believe that every resident needs to feel that they're safe in our community. And so that would be the goal to work on um, making sure that that happens. And it will take some time and it's gonna take some resources, but just by ha having these hearings, um, working with the Saunders company um, is certainly showing that that is a priority for this body. And I think that, you know, as I, as I um, add to this, um, can't agree more with, with the full scope of what we're looking to do as it relates to reimagining safety. I was, you know, I'm honored to serve on a national board uh, for reimagining safety with 20 other elected officials from across the country of cities of all sizes through the National League of City. We had our first meeting today. In fact, I have the CAHOOTS uh, website up right now reading through that in Eugene, Oregon. We're all looking at different aspects of this and diving really deep in it, but with the shared commitment that we're all going to work hard to make these things become a reality, you know, across the board. And so, you know, one of the things that I've been looking at, for instance, is, you know, having a creating a 21st century call taking center, uh, one that can can put these calls in the right direction because as it stands today um are the people aren't trained to do so um quite as adequately as they need to be to to be to meet best practices so that's an area of opportunity for us to do that 
We've made some changes internally, uh, taking them out of sworn officer positions and put them into the Department of Safety. And so we'll continue to look at that and build out on that because that's that's an important piece of this. But we're, everything is going to be looked at and no stone's going to be unturned. And you have a shared commitment of seven members of this body to make sure that you know we're all working towards this common goal. Thank you, council members. I truly appreciate uh, your responses and um, Ms. Evans for your, your testimony this evening. Up next, we have Christopher Carver. Yes, good evening, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Uh, we can thank you for the opportunity to speak to, uh, to both the council members present and the greater community concerned about this particular issue. Uh, I'm speaking to you as a 26-year public safety industry veteran. Uh, having served uh, all the way from New York City uh, as their director of fire dispatch operations and getting my start here in Greater Columbus and Truro Township on the east side. And I was actually, uh, the council member, Remy, you stole my thunder just a bit because you went exactly where I was about to go. Uh, the, the one caution as someone with a veteran, with a, a veteran's level of experience in this type of endeavor is to never forget that the begin and the end and the middle of uh, public safety interaction is at 911 and 311. And I wanted to advise the council and just make mention that there are a variety of communities around the country that are doing great things in reimagining public safety, starting with those processes. Whether their 911 center is managed and supervised effectively, whether it has effective policy and procedures, whether it has an effective number of people that work in it, and whether it is sufficiently connected to the other non-traditional and traditional resources that they need. Those are all elements that are absolutely essential as part of this process. And I had been somewhat disappointed to sit here for an hour and a half and really not hear that mentioned very much. I appreciate what the city has done to start the process of improving 911 in Columbus, um, but I have to confess that there's a ways to go. I myself have dialed 911 and gotten a busy signal trying to report a car accident. I myself, because of my, my professional relationship on the technology side where I work today, know that there are challenges that are being overcome. So I just wanted to make mention as a resident uh, of Clintonville that I hope the council keeps focus on that particular element of this because that will be essential to moving forward. The other piece I also wanted to mention that I've seen in my previous employment uh, working for the nation's 911 association and in the city of New York is the value of transparency. This city would, I think, do well to invest in the ability to report out on just how effective the public safety forces and 911 services are. Uh, the city of New York established a single point website where you can go in and see the end-to-end -end response times for call types. You can see just what the situation is today, just what the impacts will be from the investments that are made in non-traditional responses and non-traditional response models. That will give power to the effort. That'll give and document for the public the validity of taking this approach and demonstrate the, the, the really the, the intelligence behind making these types of, of decisions. But it will also assure the public, I think, of one of their greatest concerns, which is if you take away resources from patrol, if you take away resources from fire and EMS, it creates the perception potentially uh, that those resources will not be available when they are needed. And going back to the 911 example, the one thing I would caution is just remember that most emergencies are reported as what people think they are, not what they really are. And it takes the response and the investigation and the actual interaction with the public to determine what it actually ends up becoming. You know, how many reports of public actually are, uh, how many reports of fires actually are. That's another caution I would just uh, remind everyone and encourage you to think about as we move forward with this really valuable effort. Thank you for the time. Thank you, sir, uh, for your public service. And uh, we definitely appreciate your testimony this evening to underscore what many of us, you know, have been talking, not specifically on this hearing, but in other, convert, in other uh, hearings uh, about uh, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of 911 and 311 and how we can bolster and strengthen those um, both of those entities. Uh, Councilmember Remy, I know that you kind of touched on it a little bit, but, uh, and you stole it thunder, but you, it, do you want to uh, add any additional comments? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you know this is important work uh, at, at the beginning of the at the beginning of the entire uh, call that that the necessary work that needs to be done. So thank you for backing me up on that one. Uh, uh, that was unsolicited uh, support. So I appreciate that. I also brought up today in our meeting, uh, you know, my national meeting, the impact of civil service in and how this shapes, you know, a department like the police department. And again, you know, that's a, an area of focus of, that I am very interested in uh, looking into and because some of our civil service practices, although we have great people there and the civil service commission, but some of those practices uh, cause, you know, significant delays in hiring. Um, they diminish um, not not by, by anybody's fault, but they diminish some of the diversity um, achievements that we would like to make because of the, the policies that are in place. And so these are things that, you know, that are impactful from even the very, very beginning when we look at hiring the right personnel and we want to make sure that we we streamline this process from the beginning to the absolute end. And so, um, you know, we're trust me, we're, we're working very hard and this is a very um, important topic to all of us. It's obviously top of mind and, and really a top priority this year. Thank you. Council Member Tyson, any thoughts? All right. Wonderful. Uh, thank you again uh, for that testimony. Uh, up next, we have Leron Carlton. Hello. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to the city and the council for this discussion uh, on the flexibility of this during the pandemic. Um, this is a very important topic that needs to be addressed as to best serve the people of Columbus and to create a more safe and equitable society. Um, you know, I feel that establishing alternatives to public safety crisis response is a vital issue for the city. Um, you know, as loosely said by Maslow and Kaplan, if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a male, a nail. Basically saying that if the police are viewed as a hammer, every single situation that they encounter is a nail. And that's not necessarily good for them. And in essence, actually can be a disservice to them uh, by making their job more complicated and kind of erode that relationship. So I really think the time has come for us to further develop and deploy the right tool for the job. Um, personally, uh, I saw the first time impact that attacking every problem with a single tool like a hammer created in my service uh, in the Middle East. We had evaporation of public trust. We developed an antagonistic relationship with other people that we were actually there to serve, which kind of ultimately helped fuel resentment and insurgent movements. You know, we experienced flare ups of violence in response to that degraded relationship and really just increased a loss of life, but also encountered more difficulties in doing our core job. I believe that it's really vital that our communities and cities learn these lessons now and change. Um, you know, so one of the things that I kind of find was pretty interesting when I was looking at the Treatment Advocacy Center in 2015, they talked about the people with unrelated mental illness were 16 times more likely to be killed by police during an encounter. Uh, and I found that really, really troubling. Now, what I love to see in Columbus is that we do have this collaboration with Medicare, uh, I love that everything Sergeant Harris talked about, love the benefits and what we're doing with that. You know, but I think we can look at other cities for success. Um, I believe the city should expand the crisis response team and expand the relationship with NetCare. Um, you know, as we've, we've seen people mention cahoots, uh, you know, there's also other areas like Anne Arundel County. Um, they have a program where they provide mental health training for all police officers. They have mobile crisis teams that also coordinate follow-ups um, and deal with one-on-one -on -one coordination with the individual, which I think is great. Um, you know, this type of application would need to be coupled with a reallocation of city resources to provide a better infrastructure and security in high risk areas. Currently, I believe there's three CPD substations in zone four, I think zone four, yeah, um, which covers a massive area of Linden, Ohio State, and Whetstone. Uh, you know, based on the recent map I reviewed, there is no stations on Hudson or in the middle upper portion of Linden. There also really seems to be a lack of community infrastructure centers um, that could be used as maybe alternative care centers or late night programming. The mobile crisis team and net collab collaboration is the first step. And I really just want to get and thank Sergeant Harris for his commitment and work in the area. Uh, with the shift from police as the proverbial hammer to every situation, I believe this should be a vital and high level component that the city council and mayor focus on in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your, your testimony this evening. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, we, you, you definitely have to be able to bring uh, different tools to, to any 
job, right, in order to get the, the right job done. Um, so you, you absolutely have my support there. Um, Councilmember Tyson, Councilmember Remy, any questions there? Uh, just just one, I know that you mentioned one city. Did you have any other cities you wanted us to, to take a look at uh, that you feel have uh, robust alternative uh, programs uh, that might be helpful here in Columbus? Um, so as I mean, as I mentioned, you know, the CAHOOTS program out in Eugene, I read quite a bit about that. Um, you know, I, I think that without looking at the city perspective, I think actually looking at some of the military, it's kind of some of what they do with civil affairs. Uh, they actually have agencies and programs that go into villages that build and do things that they realize that, hey, I can't send an infantry or grunt in to kick down the door all the time. Sometimes I need to, do, I need to have a guy that can come in and bring a doctor or you know, a veterinary. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a focus in the cities. I just think that really an increase in civil uh, community relations is really the key thing. Got it. Thank you so much. Actually, I, that's the first um, a suggestion of using a, a military, uh, that military-like approach. As I, I haven't heard that just yet. Uh, so that, that's helpful um, information there this evening. Thank you for that. Up next, we have Laura Downing. Hi, uh, thank you, Council Member Faber. My name is Laura Downing and I manage the Victims of Crime Program at Community Refugee and Immigration Services. I really appreciate this presentation and I want to share some thoughts and perspectives from our program, which serves victims of crime with limited English proficiency. We've seen a major lack of language access to the police and the courts. And so I want to stress the importance of guaranteeing that any alternative crisis response program have language justice at its core from the beginning in order to accomplish what the Columbus Police and other local police departments have failed to do, which is to provide equal access to everyone in the community. Uh, I don't have time to share every piece of what that would look like, uh, but here are some of the core components. Um, one is a budget appropriate to pay qualified crisis trained interpreters and to provide phones for every responder to access teleinterpretation. Um, a good language access plan requires a multi-layered approach with document translation, in-person interpreters, teleinterpreters, and multilingual responders. Um, it also needs a written policy that requires um, qualified and unbiased interpretation at all interactions involving an individual with limited English proficiency. Um, that would include some kind of decision-making model um, to help responders identify the need for interpretation, the correct target language, um, and the acquisition process of in-person teleinterpreters or video relay interpretation. Um, there needs to be a prohibition on using children as interpreters. Um, and in the rare occasions when a qualified interpreter isn't available and a bilingual bystander must be used um, temporarily, there needs to be some kind of signed statement attesting to their language proficiency and agreeing to complete an accurate interpretation along with collecting that information or that person's name and contact information. Um, there also needs to be tracking and data collection in order to monitor compliance and evaluate language access procedures, um, recruitment, including pay incentives for bilingual and multilingual staff. Um, who are representative of the communities they work culturally and linguistically. Um, but those, those staff need to be trained if they're going to be used as interpreters because just being bilingual doesn't qualify you as an interpreter necessarily. Um, and then there also needs to be training for the interpreters in crisis response and trauma-informed care, as well as for the responders and how to work with interpreters and limited English proficiency individuals. Um, so I'll just end by saying that language access isn't sufficient by any means for cultural responsiveness, um, but it's that necessary prerequisite. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for bringing this important topic up. I want to kick it uh, over to our panel to, to respond. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Columbus is, is a growing community. We have a growing uh, pop, new American population uh, and the, the need to have, uh, you know, equitable language access. Um, how are you currently uh, engaging with residents that are in need of in, interpretation services right now? And um, if you're not, what is the plan for the future?
So anyone from that so care can, or, yeah. or oops, I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> um, so I can speak to um, what we do with um, MCR. So currently we have access to the language line. Um, we are actually presently working with um, another company to have um, video access to interpreters um, via our the cell phones that the clinicians carry. Um, we're just trying to work that out with our IT department, but I'm hoping we can have that online in the next couple of months. And so, um, Ms. Perry, so that would mean if you are uh, on site and someone would need services, very much like court interpretation, somebody could be on the phone uh, interpreting. Obviously, the impact, the impact of that interaction, um, the, the gravity of that situation uh, could be a little tricky to navigate that type of communication, uh, right? Yes, absolutely. Ideally, you would want to have a live in-person interpreter, um, but given the limitations and the costs associated with that, um, we can use the language line, which is via phone. Um, video is actually much better, um, especially when working with um, uh, ASL and things like that. Um, it just makes things much, much easier. Um, but we're hoping to have that online soon. But in the meantime, we do have the language line available um, where we can utilize that um, with many, many different um, dialects. And um, that seems to work pretty well for us. Yeah, I, I don't know, uh, Council Member Remy chairs our, our, um, our, um, our committee uh, that serves our new American population. And I, I'm sure that you wanna lean in here, but this is definitely uh, you know, something that I do not want to take for granted at all as, as con uh, Columbus continues to grow. We want to make sure that we are providing 100% care uh, means making sure that we are well equipped uh, to service all of our residents. Um, and that includes making sure we've got a strong uh, language access plan. So, Councilmember Remy. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Faber. Um, in 2019, we did fund, um, this is a, only a start, I don't wanna make it seem like this is all encompassing, but certainly we recognize the problems that exist and we met with division police and Commander Woods and had a conversation about, um, I'm sorry, Deputy Chief Woods, but we had a conversation about, you know, police patrol officers having access to language lines and being able to translate, you know, people that were in accidents are responding. And so um, every sergeant, sergeant was provided a phone uh, based on funding from us, but that's just the beginning. We know this is a priority. Uh, my office has been working on, I mean, we, we pretty much have got a, a full plan for a language access policy for the city of Columbus. We want to make sure, you know, we, we, we need to celebrate the diversity that we, that, you know, all of our new American refugee and immigrant population have created here in Columbus. But we also need to make sure that they feel that they're served just as equally as any other English speaking American that lives here. And so uh, this is a very big priority. We'll make sure that, um, you know, we'll continue this this thought process that you brought to us in the testimony tonight throughout these conversations so that um, everybody feels that they're being adequately and uh, rightfully served. Absolutely. Council Member Tyson? Okay, wonderful. Definitely appreciate the testimony. And last but certainly not least, we have Sadika White Thomas. Hello, how are you tonight? I would like to thank all of the council persons uh, for a wonderful meeting and thank Gail Saunders for uh, the conduct of this. I've been on several and I Actually, I'm sorry that my comments are much more global in, however, I can be very supportive of what was discussed uh, tonight in terms of uh, the CTI program and the mental health needs. We, if we're getting that many calls in a year, we certainly need to be able to respond to 100%. And so the first thing I, I want to say is reimagining safety services that when we start talking about demilitarization, the whole police department came about, the first known publicly funded police department came about in Boston in, in 1838. So we're almost 200 years past that and the police departments have not systemically changed from that. They were uh, put in place to respond to and be responded to crisis situations 
that dealt with getting people uh, organized. And so subsequently, when if we would look at our, the whole organization, I'm saying demilitarization talks about the totality of the organization, not just restrictive weapons and equipment policies. It means completely changing the organization structure that emulates a military organization based on, for example, the ranks and the status, the chiefs to patrol officers. There must be a total change of the organization if we expect a totally different response to a community now that's 200 years beyond the way it was originally organized. And so I'm saying that in fact, we need to look at the organization itself. The reason why you're talking tonight and you're saying hiring 20 people and, and, and you wanna fund it, by rights council does fund programs, but they fund programs that have been vetted and threshed out through the administration, that the administration should be bringing you a fully vetted program that says this is why we need to have a 1.8, 2.8, 3.8 million dollars. This is how we're going to deploy the 20, whether it's a co-op program, whether it's a single program, a nonviolent program, whatever it is, that's the administration's job to tell the council. Council then sees that it's appropriate and they then as the taxpayers, overseers, they then, in fact, appropriate that. Secondly, the current chief cannot be expected to make the systemic change because he's too institutionalized. Therefore, you were on the right track when you had the national search. As a citizen, and I'm only speaking as a citizen, you're gonna have to conduct another national search for a change agent. If you want the changes to come about in the police department that, uh, Councilman Ramey is talking about being on that national committee. That's a privilege. And they are going to look at it and they're going to look at it from a systemic standpoint. They're not going to look to say, I just want to change a couple things. Secondly, you're going to have to consider how, when, and where weapons should be used. Consider no weapons. You can't kill people if you don't. <laughs> Review the training of the officers and then offer incentives for officers to live in Columbus so that they can understand Columbus. So at this point, I'll stop and, you know, I'll maybe come back on for another so that I can have some more to say. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we appreciate you, you know, taking time out of your schedule to join us, not only on this conversation, but others. And we look forward to your continuous engagement beyond these conversations. Uh, we truly want this to be uh, community driven uh, and it, it's not just the seven of us making these decisions. Um, that's why these conversations are so incredibly important. Uh, so thank you for, for tuning in uh, and participating uh, tonight as well. Um, with that being said, I wanna once again, thank you, uh, extend my appreciation to all of our speakers who have provided testimony this evening. I will now turn it back over to council member Tyson to close us out. Thank you, Council Member Favor. Um, and again, this brings us to us to the end of tonight's town hall meeting on reimagining public safety. I want to thank everyone who made this evening's town hall possible. Sergeant Matt Harris of the Columbus Police Department, Dr. Brian Stroll and Michelle, Dr. Brian Stroll and Michelle Perry representing NetCare, Anita Clark and Marion Stuckey representing Columbus Public Health. My council colleagues for, for leading these very important conversations. And certainly I know tonight we also were joined by President Harden, Councilmember Dorans, and certainly Councilmember Remy. And, um, and again, my co-chair on this committee for us tonight, um, Councilmember Faber has done an amazing job. I also wanna thank all of our the council staff and um, the Saunders company for helping us to set up and run the town Hall series. I'm just really appre very appreciative of her um, gaining, um, getting information from us through various modes of communication to provide us with the information that we need. And then I want to thank CTV for broadcasting this event. And most importantly, I want to thank the residents, the residents that took the time this evening to um, share their comments, but also um, all the residents that um, 
residents that are providing information um, on this very important topic um, throughout this, this period that we're in right now of reimagining public safety. We have two remaining town, hall, town halls in our series of six of reimagining public safety. We have one tomorrow, Thursday, um, January 28th at 4 p.m. And that president President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown will host a town meeting on investing in violence prevention. And then we will also have one next Tuesday, February the 2nd at 530. And Council Member Emmanuel Remy will host it on investing in accountability and a better division of police. Council will take the feedback we're receiving during the Reimagining Public Safety Town Hall series, and in conjunction with the resident survey responses and the quantitative data we, were, we have received from the Saunders Company focus groups to help craft a 2021 operating budget that prioritizes the, the residents' voices and keeps our families safe. This concludes tonight's Town Hall. I want to thank everyone who has participated this evening, and have a great rest of your night. Thank you.